I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm not used to talking with a mic. I, I'm usually loud enough with that. So. Um, <laughs> first, I'd like to thank uh, Wasp for inviting me to, to speak to you today. Uh, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm the coordinator for the Predatory Bird Monitoring Scheme, which is a, a quite a large, large group of, of uh, specialists in, in various aspects, um, and sort of animal chemistry, ecology, things like that. So um, I'm representing a, a, a team here, some of the names you can see on, on the screen here. But the one team member that I've missed off this is all of you. Because this is a citizen science project. And without your help, the project cannot uh, go ahead. And so I'm hoping to convince you of that through the talk and convince you to contribute to the scheme. Okay, so during today's talk, I'll talk about why we monitor pollutants in raptors. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just check. <laughs> I feel that work better. Okay, so uh, again, yeah, uh, why monitor pollutants in raptors? A bit of background and names of the PB mass. Uh, how the scheme works practically. Uh, I'll convince you of why the one of the most important things that comes out of the scheme is a tissue archive. I'll then give you a, a flavour of some of the recent results from the, the the scheme, and then at the end, hit you with the how you can help the PB mass. Okay, so why monitor pollutants in raptors? Well, first of all, they're a charismatic species, and this is really good for getting volunteer collectors to send us in, in dead birds that they find. Uh, we can use the, those raptors to measure the exposure to and accumulation of the bioavailable fraction of the pollutants. You can have a concentration of a, a pollutant in the environment, but not all of it is necessarily available to be accumulated in the tissues of wildlife. But if we're finding it in the birds, then de facto it is available to, 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 to wildlife. Of course, so some of the birds we're studying have an intrinsic high conservation status. Significant amounts of money have been spent on reintroducing uh, red kites and white tailed sea eagles. And we have seen historically that these, these populations of raptors are sensitive to, to the impacts of chemical pollutants. I'll just give you a couple of examples here. The classic one, the organic chlorine um, story. So this work, work by uh, Ian Newton demonstrated that until we saw falls in, in, in the levels of organic chlorine insecticides, uh, we, we didn't see a, a recovery of, of uh, populations, and this is this, uh, kestrels here. Of course, they're now struggling kestrels, and we're trying to work out why. Um, a more recent example is, is the impact of uh, dichlorophenac on, on uh, um, vulture populations in Pakistan and northern India. Uh, this caused 95% of population declines, and was due largely to uh, adult mortality through renal failure and visceral gout. And as, as I said, this has been linked to the use of dichlorophenac to treat livestock. Going back to my list of why monitor uh, pollutants in raptors, in addition to those, those uh, uh, reasons I've given you, what raptors do is they, they spatially integrate relatively large areas. And also as top predators, they, they accumulate uh, chemicals that we're particularly worried about. And these chemicals are, are ones that biomagnetize through the food chain. And I'll, I'll explain both of those uh, concepts now. So this, is, this, this uh, graph shows, shows here just a um, data taken from Har Harvey et al's uh, Raptors a Field Guide survey and monitoring. And it shows some sort of figures that we have for, for the, the area of uh, home range size for, for various species of raptor. And uh, so you can see here, but, but what I want to show you with this graph is that compared with small mammals, they're orders of magnitude greater. Why is that important? Well, it means that you can cover relatively large areas with relatively few samples, where 
so that you can you can analyze relatively small samples but get an overview of of the uh, the levels of, of pollutants in the environment. Now, of course, if you if you're interested in um, uh, the difference between concentrations here in this room compared with uh, sort of half a kilometre away, then raptors wouldn't be the, 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 the species to use. You probably would be looking at, at using uh, small mammals. So what? So for very precise figures, you wouldn't use use uh, uh, raptors, but for larger areas, you, you definitely would. And this is a, a relatively old, old um, image, but what, what this is showing for the, for the osprey is, is that as you move up through its food chain, you get an increasing concentration of, in this case, DDT, in, in the tissues of the various species of fish until you get to the osprey at the top here. So what that means is, at relatively low concentrations in the environment, in the water or the soil, you may well be able to detect uh, concentrations of pollutants in the top predators. So they're almost an early warning um, uh, signal for, for, for that uh, pollutants are accumulating through the food chain. Okay, so a bit of background and, and the uh, run through the aims of the PBMS. So it started in the 1960s, it's not called the PBMS at that stage, but uh, it started with investigating you know, the role of organic chlorine insecticides in bird decline. And so you've got pictures of Ian Newton here explaining, I think, the John Jeffrey, sorry. Um, and uh, then we, it moved on to look at uh, uh, industrial contaminants like PCBs and mercury. Uh, but now we're, we're, we're sort of broadened the, the focus of the scheme, so, so we're interested in accumulation of lead in, in, in raptors, uh, particularly uh, uh, red kite and other scavenging species. Um, industrial contaminants such as graminated flame retardants, so we've done some work on, on uh, sparrowhawks and uh, gannet eggs from Elsa Craig and Bass Rock. There's been some really good studies coming out of the PBS on that. Um, we've also sort of broadened our remit a little, um, as you'll notice this isn't a raptor, <laughs> but it is a predator. <laughs> Uh, what we've done is we've teamed up with the Cardiff University Otter Project. So they're, they're, they're getting around about the, uh, 100 um, otters a year, and they, they retain uh, tissues and send subsamples to, to the PBMS. And we use the otter as our freshwater sentinel species. So when we're looking at the otter, we think what we're, it's telling us about is the levels of contamination in fresh water. But one of the main focuses, and something I'll come on to later in the talk, is, is uh, rodenticide, so anticoagulant rodenticide. And we've, we've, I'll show that figures showing, showing that uh, uh, the levels of, of exposure are, are, are quite significant in a range of, of, of raptors. So as I said, it's, uh, the predatory bird monitoring schemes focus on chemical surveillance and monitoring in sentinel species, these raptor species. It's both long-term and national scale. Uh, we're funded by, by CEH itself. We have a, a, a natural England and an industry body called the Campaign for Responsible Redenticide Use. Uh, but what we really rely upon is, is the contribution of, of members of the public and as such it's a citizen science project. We look for trends due to changes in use or larger scale phenomena. Uh, that, that can, can lead to, to changes in the levels of pollutants that we find in the birds. An example of a large-scale phenomenon would be changes in land use, so a, a reduction or an increase in, in uh, a rough grassland. We'd expect to see changes in, in the levels of contaminants in the birds because they'll switch to the, 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 the species that, that, that feed upon dominantly on bowls. You, 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 if the, if the grassland's not there, the bowls aren't there, and so they're feeding on other prey that may well have higher concentrations of pollutants in their, in their uh, bodies, and so those species, such as uh, barn owl, will have a higher concentration in their diet of pollutants. 
So the aim is to identify hazards, assess what, what risk those hazards pose to both individuals and populations. Look for, to quantify environmental drivers, as the example I've just given. And so then inform uh, policy, evaluate mitigation measures that are put in place as part of that, those policies, and then assess the risk to higher priority species as well. But like I've mentioned before, one of the key outputs of the scheme is to uh, generate this tissue and egg contents archive that can be used for monitoring and wider research as well. So how does the scheme work? Well, we ask people to send in dead birds of prey that they find. It can be any species of bird, uh, of raptor, and, uh, and they could have died of any cause. So the majority of birds we get are, are road casualties, collisions, or, or uh, uh, birds that have starved, actually. Um, and what happens is that you, if you find one, we ask you to pick it up, and then give us a call, and we'll send you out a box, which allows you to post the bird back to us free of charge. Then when we receive the bird, we freeze it, and then uh, Elaine here, who's, who's one of my, my colleagues, and she actually does all the work. I just talk about it. So um, <laughs> she'll carry out a post-mortem examination on the bird, the results of which we'll send back to you, so you get feedback on the bird. So things like age, the sex of the bird, the nutritional status, and a whole range of it. There's about 100 observations that we take, and we send you back those, those results. We then take a t uh, the tissue samples that we put in our sample archive, and a subset of that each year, we carry out chemical analysis on that. And that gives us sort of time trends for, for uh, contaminants in, in various species. And then we use those to uh, write our annual reports that give a, give a, a summary of what we've found, uh, and also scientific papers, and, and a lot of the data you can get from our, our website as well. So what do the birds die of? Well, like I said, oh sorry, what birds do we receive? So uh, we receive around 300 to 400 birds a year, and a third of those are barn owls. Uh, and then we have a significant number of, of sparrowhawks, buzzards, tawny owls, and to a less extent, extent uh, red kite and, and kestrel. There's also a, a numbers category here, which is up the other species, and and they can vet, they're relatively low numbers and they can vary quite a lot each year. Some years we don't get any, and, and other years we'll get perhaps five, so something like that. Okay. And what do they die of? Now this, is, this figure here is taken from the whole extent of, of the, the um, uh, running of the scheme, so the last 50 years. So, so here we see that most, most of the birds die of uh, accidental causes, so like I say, road traffic accidents and um, uh, collisions. About a fifth of them die from natural causes, so these are things like starvation. Uh, now, this persecution mis misuse in includes sort of poisonings from the 60s and, and what have you, so, so there's that, that it's probably higher in that figure than, than it currently is. We probably only get one or two a year that, that we think have, have died of perhaps from a denticide poisoning. And then uh, there's, there's some that we just can't uh, uh, distinguish the, the uh, cause of death, or can't be so sure that we'd, we'd uh, uh, categorise it as a certain kind of death. But they're still useful samples, those, those ones we take. Okay, and of course this, this varies by species. So you've got, um, uh, for the spalock and the barn owl, you see quite a difference in, in the, the cause of death that we find. So, uh, you know, most of the barn owls we get have died due to uh, road accidents, whereas uh, for uh, sparrowhawks, uh, window collisions and other types of collisions. So the tissue archive, so I've mentioned this before, like I say, we've got tissues going back to the late 60s all, all the way through to the present. And we have egg contents. I haven't specifically mentioned this now, but we also ask uh, those licensed uh, uh, people to, to send in any adult and deserted eggs that they may find in the nest during their monitoring activities. Uh, from the, the carcasses, we take liver, kidneys, brain, uh, muscle, bone, feathers. So we take, we take primary uh, 
primary feathers, secondary feathers and breast feathers. And actually at the moment we are retaining the whole wings as well, so, so we've got a view to use those for, for particular studies. And then if, oh, sorry, and then if the bird's in a decent enough condition, then, then we also look at, uh, uh, take uh, fat deposits as well. Although that's relatively rare for some species like sparrow hawks, which are pretty lean even in, in the best condition. Okay, so we use these samples in various um, um, sort of collaborative studies. So, so with the University of Highlands and Islands, we're looking at lead and buzzards at the moment. So that's going to be a paper coming out probably in, in 2018. Um, we're also collaborating with the Royal Dick Veterinary School in Edinburgh. And what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're referring the inquiries from Scotland to, to a PhD student of theirs who's who's carrying out a, a study on, on factors affecting Scottish raptor populations with a particular focus on golden eagles. Uh, but what she's doing is she's taking subsamples so they come back to the fever mess so we're not missing out on those samples. We've also sent uh, wing, oops, sorry, wing samples to the University of Manchester where they're looking at, at the morphology of the mus mus muscles between different species of raptor. Uh, and Samples are from Red Kites down to the University of Reading, and they're looking at, at the importance and, and impact of anthropogenic food sources to, to Red Kite. And then um, we're waiting on the results of this, but, but, but we've sent um, a significant number of samples to the University of Lucerne in Switzerland, who are carrying out a genetic structure analysis of the barn owl population from 1980 to present. So that'll be some really interesting work, I think. In addition to this, those, uh, we also have ongoing um, uh, sort of sample sharing uh, uh, agreements with uh, animal plant health agencies, so uh, where we're, we're swabbing the birds that come in for West Nile virus and avian influenza. Uh, with IOZ, we sent down samples for, for identification of uh, trick in, in the raptors that we received. If we have a, a a case come into as an inquiry that, that suggests it might be a, a, a poisoning incident, then we'll refer that to the Wildlife Incident Investigation Scheme. But even if we don't, but subsequently in, in our, our post-mortem examination, we think that's probably the cause, then we send in samples to them as well. So, so that they, they, they capture that information. Um, one of our purposes previously, we've had, had those submitted from the A55. Uh, uh, that's another little hiatus at the moment, but, but we'd like to re-establish that, that, that agreement so, so we, we get those by now. Um, like I said, with the otter samples, we carry out analysis on, on uh, samples from the Cardiff University Otter Project. Then also, we have a, 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 a sort of referral system with, with uh, Project Splatter, which is looking at, at the scale of, of uh, road casualties in, in the UK. That's another project run out of Cardiff. Okay, recent results. Um, I'm going to talk about two, two sets of results here. And the first one is the mer mercury and golden eagle eggs. So why are we looking at that? Well, <clears throat> we use golden eagles as, as our sentinel species for, uh, for upland. Uh, uh, but we use eggs because obviously we don't get too many carcasses in. We get more eggs than we do carcasses. And uh, we're looking at mercury in those uh, uh, eggs because it's the focus for international agreements trying to reduce the levels of mercury in the environment. Now recently we've, we've had access to more, analytic, more sensitive analytical, analytical methods. And so what we've done is we've reanalyzed some of the eggs that were non-detected from previous years. And also we've used stable isotope analysis to distinguish between the prey base. Now what this does is it, it allows us to, to distinguish between the, the eggs from, from females that have been feeding mostly on land to those that have been feeding mostly from, from uh, birds and prey that, that are, are, are feeding on, on food sources from the marine environment. And what we've demonstrated is, is that mercury residues are lower in eggs from terrestrial feeding uh, females compared to those that are marine feeding. And you can see the, the results here. So, so the, on the left hand side, this just shows that we can separate 
uh, terrestrial and marine feeding females by their stabilisotope um, uh, concentration in, in the eggs. And then it shows that, that you have lower concentrations of total mercury in uh, terrestrial feeding birds compared with coastal feeding birds. And if you compare that to white-tailed sea eagle, then look, these golden eagles are more similar to, to the white-tailed sea eagle. Okay, on to rodenticides. And um, um, I'll be talking about second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. These are the main ones used now in the UK. Uh, they cause hemorrhaging in, in uh, exposed individuals, and, uh, but it's non target specific. So they're used to control rats and, and house mice, but it could cause the same toxicity in any mammal or bird. Um, and we've demonstrated previously that there's widespread exposure to many non-target species. Now the problem is that these second generation anticoagulant rodenticides are more persistent and so last longer in the tissues of the prey of, of these predators. And also they're 10 to a thousand times more toxic to, to predators than previously used rodenticides such as warfarin. Um, so this greater toxicity and persistence increases the potential for both secondary exposure, so that's when the predator feeds upon a, a, a prey that has previously fed upon a rodenticide, and also secondary poisoning, so it's the same process but to an extent that you see uh, mortality in, in the, that, that individual. So this, is, this shows a range of, of levels of exposure, so, so it's a percentage of individuals of all these different species that, that we've been able to detect with emphasis in their bodies. Um, and I've highlighted a uh, barn owl here um, as uh, it's sort of a middle of the pack really, but, but, but uh, still a significant amount. Um, if we compare that to You'd imagine that barn owls feeding on small mammals, yeah, they're likely to be exposed to rodenticides. But actually, some of the, the work we've shown is that sparrowhawks are just as likely to be exposed to rodenticides as barn owls. And this is what this figure shows here for both juveniles and adults, that you have a similar proportion of, of barn owls and sparrowhawks with detectable levels of rodenticide in their, in their liver. Now, if you look at the, the magnitude of residues, then, then there is actually a difference there, particularly for the, for the, the adults, where you see higher concentrations of rodenticides in the barn owl livers compared with, with uh, sparrowhawk. So there are species differences, but in terms of magnitude uh, of residues, rather than the likelihood of being exposed. Now, barn owls, if you look at the long-term trends, we, we see that, that um, there's, we've seen an increase in the proportion of birds that are exposed, but that's perhaps has levelled off a bit, but is pretty variable year to year. But the focus on rodenticides is heightened in the last few years, and this is because of concerns in the UK about effects on wildlife. And so, last year was introduced a stewardship scheme for the antiprogram rodenticides. And the aim of that was to try and change user behaviour so that unintentional wildlife exposure was reduced. And they're, they're using the, the data they generated on the bar now as a key indicator of whether that initiative is having, having success. Now, concurrent with this, but, well, but around about in 2006, we uh, improved our, our um, ability to, to detect lower concentrations of, of rodenticides. So you have to be careful that when you change your analytical technique, you can see an increase in the numbers that are exposed to of, uh, rodenticides and have rodenticides in their liver. But that may be partly due to this increased sensitivity. So I'm afraid I'm going to switch between the two of it here, so I apologise for that. This is using those more sensitive techniques, 
So in the baseline years, which were uh, 2006 to 2012, um, so prior to this introduction of, of the stewardship scheme, these are the concentrations. So these are using the more, more uh, sensitive techniques in both the baseline and 2016. We've just published this report uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, what it's showing is since the, the introduction of the stewardship scheme, there actually isn't that much change. But at this point, we wouldn't necessarily expect that to, to see that change. Partly because of the persistence of, of, the, res, uh, of the residues of the rodenticides in, the, in the, the prey and the, the, the barn owls themselves. And also, the stewardship scheme only really kicked in halfway through 2016. So the interesting thing, I think, is going to be 2017, and when it's been, they've had a, a, about 18 months of, of uh, the stewardship uh, kicking in. So, so that's watch this space, really. Um, looking at, at differences between, between England, Scotland, and Wales, we do see differences. Now, these, these are, oops, sorry, these are using the less sensitive techniques but, uh, from uh, earlier periods, but. But what it does show is, is that we've, we've got differences and, and um, for Bromodile alone, uh, Wales seems to have a lower incidence of, of uh, rodenticides compared with England and Scotland for barn owls. Okay. I'm going to skip that. Okay, so how can you help the PV mouse? Well, this is a map from the last few years of, of the... the, the um, birds that we've received. Um, what this shows for a start is that it generally follows um, the higher populations of both humans and, and the, the uh, uh, birds themselves. But what I'd really like to do is encourage you to start filling in this a bit more. Give us more birds. So if you see a bird that's on the side of the road, if it's safe to stop and pick it up, I'd really like you to pick it up. It doesn't matter which predatory uh, raptor species it is, we're, we're interested in receiving it. But at the moment, we're, we're desperate for barn owls. Um, because to carry out that analysis that I've been showing you, we, we really need about 100 barn owls a year. And at the moment, for 2017, we're on about 70. So, so um, I'd really like you in the next few months at least to keep an eye out for, for any barn owls you might see and send us in. Contact us and we'll, we'll make it as easy as possible for you to send the bird in to us. Okay, obviously if there are suspicious circumstances then you should be contacting the police and probably the RSPB uh, instance team as well. If it's non-suspicious, a road casualty, window collision, then please do contact PBMS. We'll send you out one of these boxes, they're very easy to use. Um, and in the meantime, while you're waiting for the box to arrive, please keep the bird as cold as possible, ideally frozen. Obviously wrapped up if it's next to your peas. <laughs> so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. And um, I think we're going to take questions at the end of the other, other uh, uh, talk. So that's great. Thank you for your time.